Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Bill Real, how are you doing? Man, I am doing so good. It is another episode of Mormonism Live. Here we are, you and me, doing this again. Maven's behind the scenes, making sure that we stay in line. And uh, life is good. What's new and exciting on your end, RFM? Well, we've got so many announcements to make before we get into tonight's show, so we got to go quickly. By the way, I'm loving the pink jacket. You're looking yeah. like a rather flamboyant Don Johnson. Yeah, yeah. You know what? 27 bucks on Amazon can get you, so. <laughs> wow. Not much. <laughs> Some... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, man. We're off and running, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. What are some of the announcements on your mind tonight, my friend? Okay, number one, I'm wearing a t-shirt tonight. That's, a, Ooh, that's not look, a big I think surprise. I, I think I know what's on that one. What's on it? Well, you have, yeah, look at that. It is the Radio Free Mormon logo. It's me. Look at that. I'm wearing me. And wearing I wanted you. to give a shout out to the nice individual who was kind enough to send this to me at exmoshirts.com. I'm pretty sure if you type in uh, Exmo Shirts into your search engine, you'll come up with this great website where they sell all sorts of shirts for apostates and near apostates. Um What's happened is, uh, Bill, I'll let you talk about this because it's sort of been in flux. There used to be a site that I sold um, Radio Free Mormon merchandise from. And I don't know what happened, but everything got dumped out of there. And then in the process, you are creating and have created a website, a store actually, yeah. for all sorts of merchandise, including Radio Free Mormon merchandise. And so the decision was made by the board that that's going to be where all the merchandise related to Mormon Discussions, Inc. and its subsidiaries is going to be sold. Is that right? That's true. Now, I will say this. Just about two hours ago, maybe three hours ago, the same person, I think, from Exmo, uh, Exmo Shirts yeah. uh, reached out to me. And so we're going to at least have a conversation and see if we can collaborate and come up with a way to maybe join forces. But at present, at the present moment anyway, if you go to any of the uh, websites for the podcast, Radio Free Mormon, Mormon Discussion, Mormonism Live, uh, Marriage on a Tightrope. Up at the top, there is a button for that says gift shop. And if you click that, it takes you into our Shopify store. And there is coffee mugs, laptop cases, uh, hoodies, t-shirts, um, different kinds of jackets. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. And they've got various logos from the majority of the podcasts we have. Now, I need to also say we've added uh, uh, three new podcasts. I need to pull this up just so I don't get anything wrong as I'm doing this. Mormon. Yes. I'm hoping for a cod piece with the Radio Free Mormon logo on it. Do you have any of those? What is it? A cod piece? Cod pieces. Are they in the store yet? I don't even know what a cod piece is. Like a piece of fish? Or what are we talking about here? Uh, is it okay if I explain it to you later? I don't want to. I was, I was actually just trying to fill time while you were looking up your. Oh, I got gotcha. you. No, no sweat. So, um, of course, we got our standard umbrella podcast that people are familiar with: Mormon discussion, Radio Free Mormon, Mormonism Live, Marriage on a Tightrope. We've got some older ones that haven't had content in a while: Cognitive Dissidence, uh, Mythical Jesus, uh, Almost Awakened, which is revamped with uh, Brittany Hartley co-hosting uh, co that, mm -hmm. and then um, Backyard Professor Carrie Shirts. Uh, Where Will You Go uh, by a host named Marty. Uh, we have uh, She Became Visible with Renee Steelman and uh, Dissident uh, Daughters uh, hosted by Emily. And so there are a bunch of new podcasts. And I think we got one more coming here soon, too, but I won't announce that quite yet. Um, but I'm, I'm quite excited uh, for these new podcasts and the potential one that's on the way. Lots of new content and lots of uh, really good creative content uh producers or host of these podcasts putting out good stuff fantastic yeah yeah Wonderful. It is. i'm excited to hear these different podcasts yeah it's exceptional anything else on your mind uh, oh, in yeah. terms of announcement please sorry i'm so sorry there's no, just no, so no, much. you're good 
No First apologies. Off, Backyard that's Professor, that's you brought him up. Backyard Professor has taken to doing a live stream on Sunday evenings at six o'clock. I'm going to say PM, though that's redundant because I already said evening. But it's Sunday evening, six o'clock PM, Mountain Time, and all you have to do, I think, is I always have trouble finding it. But it's basically, I think, on the Mormon Discussion channel on YouTube. Is that right, Bill? Have you ever watched this? This is on the YouTube channel for Mormon Discussion, which is where most of our listeners are watching us right now. Okay. So if you go here on Sunday evening, 6 o'clock, Mountain Time, then it will come on and you'll be able to listen to the Backyard Professor, our very own, uh, expatiate on all things that are interesting to him. And I find them fascinating. And I, I make it a habit to watch every Sunday evening because it's a great time. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. All of the various hosts that are putting out content right now under our umbrella, I think we're all collectively averaging about a 95 to 97 percent likes uh, upvotes essentially on our videos, which is a lot different than other folks who shut their comments off and turn their likes off because they're not getting quite the, the results they'd like. But we're doing pretty good over here. Well, that's because I keep voting upvote and then cleaning up my cookies and voting. Oh, and yeah. I, that's how I spend doing my it. days. And you go incognito when you do that, right? Uh, yeah, I do okay. that. Oh, okay. You can explain <laughs> that to me later when I'm telling you what a cod piece is. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, okay. I'll explain incognito <laughs> to you later. Okay. Okay. Oh, and another thing. Please. Another thing. This Friday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. I'll be redundant throughout tonight. Um, I'm doing an uh, Ask Me Anything, an AMA at Reddit, Mormon Reddit. So, uh... They reached out. They said, would you? I said, sure. And that's when it's slotted for. So you've done, have you done that, Bill? I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. Oh, a couple of times. So this is just my first time. Well, I did one in the latter day Saint Reddit forum, but I can't do that anymore. I'm not allowed to participate there anymore. Why not? Um, not everything I say is faith promoting. If you haven't heard. Is that all that's allowed there? Yeah. All that's allowed is fluffy uplifting faithful stuff you can't really ask the hard things and point people to the most rational answers okay well i won't wait up by the phone expecting them to call no i don't think they're going to be asking you anytime soon but you'll be on ex-mormon reddit doing an ama did you say saturday at 8 a.m no i did not but thank you for allowing me to repeat it it's <laughs> friday morning friday morning not tomorrow which is thursday but the day after we're talking two days two less days. than two days from now Great. Friday morning, 8 o'clock a.m., <laughs> mountain time, and uh, be there. I'll be there, and I understand it, so there's a lot of typing involved. Yeah, it will. You'll, it'll be fast and furious for a couple of hours, Yeah, and then throughout the day, if you poke your head back in, there will be 10 new questions every hour or so um, for you to answer. It'll go, it'll go for the whole day and then some maybe. Really? Yeah, you're a, you're a rock star, so I, I anticipate it'll be pretty busy there. Well, we'll see. I've had a um, keyboard made especially out of asbestos because I type so fast. Otherwise, it would burst into flame. <laughs> uh, I passed that 40, 40 words per minute and then uh, gave up because that gave me my B in typing class. So Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I think you had something. To say. I know you want to get into this. You're in charge tonight. You are uh, on track for what we're talking about but did you want to talk about last weekend and the thrive event thrive uh i didn't go to thrive itself in saint george i was part of a couple of little things outside of thrive that i thought went really well they had 250 people there from what i heard and i heard that it went really good and and i just think thrive is a it's an incredible organization i know uh it's connected to mormon stories open stories in that john serves on that board but uh just a good group of folks that really are making an effort to build community all across the country for that matter. Um, you know, places like Seattle, Washington, um, okay. you know, and uh, it's interesting to watch people leave the church with a lot of angst, a lot of turmoil because of reconstructing their own identity along with trying to keep relationships that, that maybe have been damaged. But um I think that people generally are figuring things out. Most people I think are happier after they leave, after some time has passed. And I think thrive is a huge addition to people's well being being improved on the other side of this process. I think you missed the memo bill. When, if you leave this church, you lose everything. 
Where will you go? To a few more parties. I guess so. Yeah, By the yeah, way, I do want to say, for anybody who has not gone to a Thrive event and is very concerned about the the horrible stuff that's going to happen if you go to a Thrive event, uniformly, my experience has been that people who go there are overwhelmed by the warmth, the reception, the kindness, and the understanding that they find there from other people who are at Thrive. So if you've been putting it off for any reason, like believing what it is that certain general authorities might be saying about how horrible it is outside the church, what you'll find is you don't lose everything. You actually find everything. Remember, Jesus said, he who loses his membership in the church shall find his life at Thrive. Yeah. Amen, brother. I think that's in Mark. All right. You ready to rock into it? Totally. You take it. it. Let's do it. So I'm going to add this up on the screen and we'll put this, (coughs) excuse me. So tonight I wanted to talk about the first vision and apologetics around it and specifically the apologetics RFM, which is we both know that, and we're going to focus on the 1832 account tonight. We both know that there are discrepancies there and we, we can go into some of those and we will, but my goal tonight is not really to talk about the discrepancies per se, but to show how apologists deal with those discrepancies and the arguments they make and form and then juxtapose those with how they speak to a critic and what modes of argumentation they allow themselves versus which modes they dismiss in the critic. And, and I think it'll be a little interesting. The 1832 First Vision account, by the way, do you remember how far into the church you were before you knew there was an 1832 First Vision account? I was probably back from my mission just maybe a year or two because I was okay. a lazy learner. So I... I studied stuff and I found out that this existed. Do you think many members of your ward knew it existed? Oh, no. Oh, no. I mean, it was in the 1980s that this became general knowledge, general knowledge uh, beyond me, maybe to one or two other people. And that Mm. was when Jesse, um, Dean Jesse, published that book, The Personal Writings of Joseph Smith. Is that what it was called? Is this big fat book? And my dearest friend uh, in the church at the time, whose name was Steve, read that and blew him apart and he left the church and became an angry uh, ex-Mormon after that. Yeah. And and we've done conversations. We've talked plenty of times, you on your podcast, mine on mine and us together about the whole 1832 account being cut out with a pen knife by either Joseph Fielding Smith or somebody under his direction stored in the church historian's vault for decades upon decades. And then in the 1960s, only when rumor gets out by Gerald and Sandra Tanner, that that uh, account exists, does Joseph Fielding Smith tape it back in with some scotch tape and uh, get Paul Chessman to to run out and do his thesis and act like it's been there the whole time, right? Absolutely. Very good. And you've got the image up there, the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Do you have the place where you could actually zoom in and see where the tape is? Uh, I don't I don't have access to that, but it is there. I don't know if it's that particular one, but yeah, I bet that's it. I bet if you zoom in there. It'll be in there on the margin. I mean, not in the margin, but at the binding. Because that's oh no, that's the tape out. right there. Look at that left edge, that first inch or so. Okay, so that must be the where the binding was. Yeah, look at that. That looks like it's sitting right there, and maybe it's that other edge. But it definitely, if you zoom in, you can see tape. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these discrepancies, and you and I can maybe just riff for a moment about some of these. But the first one that I wanted to mention was no Lucifer. So in the 1832 account, there's no disturbance in the grove. His He's not hearing sticks and leaves being broken and crinkled behind him. Um, Nothing's binding his tongue. At least he's not telling us that. Um, We're going to get to the major one, which is there is no heavenly father, it appears, in the 1832 account. And apologists would at least like to make some plausible deniability that maybe there was, but or deniable plausibility, right? Whichever way you say it, I'm going with it, (laughs) Bill. You got the pink jacket on. And then... uh, but it seems to me it's almost as important that he doesn't mention Lucifer. Like there's three major people in Christianity's theology. It's Satan, Heavenly Father, and Jesus. Yeah, they're um, big. Yeah, and they're 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 a big deal. And Satan's not mentioned in the 1832 account. Does does that strike you? I know the apologists would say, like, no big deal. Like he picks and chooses how he tells the story. Is it a big deal to you, do you think, that Satan's not mentioned? You know, I actually hadn't considered that, or I don't remember considering it uh, before, but uh, yeah, 
You know, it is because that's a big deal in the 1838 account, the one that is the official version. We've got a huge deal happening with Satan and the binding of the tongue. And that's what gives the, um, the drama that adds to the drama because then yeah. he is saved. There's um, a rescue that goes on when Heavenly Father and Jesus show up to release him from the bindings of Satan. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. I think it's notable for its absence in yeah. both the 1832 account as well as the 1835 account. Yep. Um, Maven, do we have the fair Mormon response to this question handy? And if not, I can pull it up as well. There I haven't we read it, but I'm going to guess it involves some mind reading. Let's see. So here's the part I wanted to draw attention to. And again, we just want to talk about the apologetics around the first vision tonight. It is clear from the available documentary evidence that the prophet did not feel constrained. By the Boom. way, mind reading. Yeah. I love they, it know, I they know Joseph Smith's motives because if the church is true, this is the only possible explanation in their mind, right? That Joseph, By the way, yeah, not just that he did not feel constrained. It is clear. Yeah, it is clear yeah. from the Usually available documentary say something's evidence. clear when it's not clear. That's just been my experience. I'm sorry I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. No, 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 you're good. And notice the last line there. And no reasonable person should be bothered that he doesn't. That oh, he doesn't mention the true Scotsman Satan. fallacy. Yeah, yeah. No true Scots. Perfect. Uh, what is a no, what is a true no true Scotsman fallacy? Uh, RFM. Ah, well, I'm glad you asked me that, laddie. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. But uh, no, the true Scotsman fallacy is when you say, well, okay, when you say every Scotsman likes haggis. You know what haggis is. Right. It's the sort yeah. of thing that's really kind of unappealing, but Scotsmen sort of eat it. Maybe Scots yeah. women do too. Yeah. But uh, uh, if you say no Scotsman likes, no, all Scotsmen like haggis. And then uh, the Scotsman says, well, I don't like haggis. And then the response to him is, you're not a true Scotsman. You're not a true. Oh, you're so much better at this than I am. <laughs> you're not the true Scotsman. Yeah. So in, in other words, as soon as somebody comes up to, uh, break apart the universal rule that you have just announced, then the way to deal with it, which actually doesn't do it, this is classified as a logical fallacy, is to say, well, then you're not a true Scotsman. Right. If you have a problem with Satan not being in the 1832 or 1835 account, you are not a reasonable person. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to point out with that we do have a Scotswoman here and... Um... I guess uh, they'll give you some coaching maybe on your uh, Scottish accents. Maven, how are you doing tonight? It's Good. To hi. Hi, everybody. I just had to jump in because 21st Century Saints is here, and I, I just knew that they were going to say something. <laughs> the true Scots women here are face palming. Yeah, they are. Don't get me started <laughs> on the Welsh women, though. Yeah. Yikes. All right. We're... All right, we're going to move on to the next one, which is the, the and again, this one is even important. I don't really want to debate this, but they're they're saying that some people have questions on whether the appearance of deity was in the heavens or near Joseph in the grove, whether it was off in the distance above the clouds and Joseph saw something because the heavens opened or whether it was uh, personages appearing to him right near him as the light came down. And these first vision accounts do describe that differently. I don't care about the argument because I don't think any real critic is finding a problem with the first vision based on where Heavenly Father and Jesus appear close by or far away. But I do want to put up their response. Uh, do you have that one, Maven? So um, will you scroll all the way up to the top so they can see the heading? Was Joseph Smith's first vision set in heaven or on earth? Now, if you'll scroll back down to that spot, Here's their explanation. Details about Joseph Smith's first vision experience are best interpreted by taking all of the extent accounts into consideration. A myopic, a myopic focus on a limited number of historical documents can only lead to misunderstanding of the past and a twisted sense of the message that the storyteller is trying to convey. RFM, how often do the apologists point to one document or mm. point to one particular issue or point to one um, possible way of seeing things without, and, and they in fact are being myopic and they don't give you the full context of the information. Is it just me or is myopic becoming the word of this administration now? Yeah, you've heard it several times, haven't you? Do you get like extra points for using it? I don't know. It should but be I, a center square on Mormon bingo. Yes. <laughs> Paul Lynn to block. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, um, but 
But no, I don't, I'm not aware of any apologists just using, uh, cherry picking just certain things uh, to support their case. <laughs> Damn. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Right. And they, on so many occasions, don't want you taking the collective forest from the trees view, but when it's convenient for them, they are huge fans of it, aren't they? Yes, they are. And so this is just so um, pejoratively stated. Details about Joseph Smith's first vision experience are best interpreted by taking all of the extant accounts into consideration. Okay. A myopic focus on a limited number of historical documents, which basically means the 1832 account. I mean, we're only really talking about four accounts. There are four primary accounts. And by primary, I mean those that were either written by Joseph Smith, like the 1832 account, or those that are directly traceable to his uh, supervision or utterances. And those, there's only four, but a myopic focus on a limited number of historical documents can only lead to misunderstanding of the past and a twisted sense of the message that the storyteller is trying to convey. Here's something I'd mentioned to you the other day, Bill. We're, we've got four primary accounts, 1832, 1835, 1838 and 1842. And just for the record, the 1842 Wentworth letter is really kind of an abbreviated synopsis of the 1838 account. There really is only three with maybe a little bit, a lot taken out and a little added in in the Wentworth letter. Yeah, well, uh, I think the main thing that we get from the Wentworth letter that we don't get in the earlier three is the uh, detail that the father and the son look exactly alike. Can't even tell them apart. It's like the Patty Duke show. Yeah. Notice there they admit Joseph Smith is a storyteller. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry. What? Notice there they, they admit Joseph Smith is a storyteller. Well, he is a storyteller. But here's the, th here's the deal, the overarching thing. I'm going to take it for granted that most of the audience has already listened and knows the groundwork on the basic differences between these accounts. And these are the differences that this article from FAIR are trying to make okay. All right, so what you have is you have two different kinds of variants between these four accounts. There are variants that are contradictory or very close to being contradictory, okay, between them. And then there are variants that are additive. In other words, there are some things that are mentioned in one account that are not mentioned in another account. You've already mentioned about Satan not showing up in the 1832 account or the 1835 account. Boom, we get to 1838, hello, Satan. And he's present in all of his glory. So that's an additive account. Uh, added an additive variant in that it doesn't contradict with something earlier because at no point earlier does Joseph Smith say Satan wasn't there, right? So it's additive. So you have these two kinds of things that are going on. Now, if you have a person who is just making stuff up and we're not talking about Joseph Smith here, this is just a hypothetical, okay? You've got a person who's making up a story and that story changes over time and over the years, they give four different versions of the story. And they have contradictory variants and additive variants. Well, if you insist on taking all of the additive variants and creating one universal story that takes into account all these additive variants, right? So uh, we'll, we'll put uh, Lucifer, we'll put Satan in there because he appears in the 1838 account, though not in the earlier two accounts. So we'll put him in there. We'll put every. We'll put God and Jesus in this universal account, even though God, the Father, doesn't show up in the 1832 account. So we're going to put everything in all of it, and then we're going to take those contradictory variants and we're going to smooth those over. All right, we're going to do something to say, hey, it's not that big a deal, and we'll get into a little bit more of that later. What I'm saying is. If we take a person who we all agree, this hypothetical person is just making up a story, then you can take a person who is making stuff up. And by following this same methodology, you can make it true. You can show that it really happened. You can show there's no problem with it. And when you look at it from that point of view, you can see that what they're doing is they are not actually analyzing the documents and trying to go where the evidence leads them in the most reasonable and rational way. Rather, they're starting with the premise that Joseph Smith had this experience and that he's telling the truth in all of his accounts. And because they start with that conclusion, that's where they end. Even though I think, as I've just demonstrated, even if you took someone who was 
making it up, and we all agree he was making it up, someone other than Joseph Smith, you could follow the exact same procedure and come to the exact same conclusion. Are you muted? No reasonable person should be bothered if they if that's the case. Like if if things are added and things are taken out, no reasonable person should be bothered by such. No human being would stack books like that. No, no. So the the next one, and I don't have any apologetic argument here. I just want to mention it because I think it is relatively serious because there are other discrepancies. How old Joseph Smith is, um, what his motives are for going into the grove, the the surrounding circumstance around him seeking and getting forgiveness. Um, but another big one is that there aren't angels mentioned in most of the accounts, but in the 1835 account with that crazy guy, Joshua, the, the Jewish minister. And when you say um, with that crazy guy, you mean that Joseph Smith was relating it to him when he came through Kirtland, Ohio? Correct. Yeah. The crazy guy being Joshua, the Jewish minister, not, not necessarily Joseph Smith. Right. Um, yeah. So the idea that only in the 1835 account, do we get this idea that there's angels? And again, I would argue that seems pretty serious, doesn't it? Like, there are angels all around while Satan is behind me trying to break twigs and, and, and rustle the leaves. And then Heavenly Father and Jesus are right in front of me. And every time I tell the story, I'm leaving one of those guys out. It just seems kind of like a, a strange anomaly. But again, I don't want to get into that one deep. And then the final one, which is the big one, in the 1832 account, Joseph Smith says, The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. And it feels, to most of us being rational, it feels as though Joseph Smith is mentioning Jesus twice and is not mentioning Heavenly Father at all. Of course, again, no mention of Satan, no mention of angels, but that the Lord opened the heavens and he saw the Lord. And it seems pretty direct what is meant by that. And yet here we are, you know, since 1965, we've we've been arguing over this point since that moment. And I want to go into detail about the arguments that come out over whether Joseph meant two beings, why he might have left Heavenly Father out, because I think at that point it gets uh, it gets interesting. Can I bring uh, up another point here before you go on? Before you get interesting, let me ha make my point. Because <laughs> I think this is significant. And this is something I discovered just about a year ago that it occurred to me. As has been mentioned here um, in the comments, one of the main differences in the 1832 account is that Joseph Smith has already concluded before going to the grove that all the churches are in a state of apostasy and that the true church is not on the earth. And he's figured that out by his study of the Bible. So he goes to the grove in the 1832 account, not to ask which church is true because he's already figured it out, but instead to ask for forgiveness of his sins, which is granted to him. In the 1838 account, the official version, Joseph Smith has not figured out that all the churches are are in a state of apostasy before going to the grove. In fact, that is his express purpose in going to the grove is to ask God, which of all the churches is his church? And then he is shocked, shocked to find out that there's gambling going on here. No, he's shocked to find out that Jesus says, my church is not on the earth. They're all in a state of apostasy and there's no true church yet upon the earth. Now, the reason I think that's really fascinating is not just because that's a fundamental contradiction. In fact, it is an inherent contradiction, the biggest contradiction that I can see in the accounts, but also because in the 1832 account, Joseph Smith already knows this, that the apostasy has occurred. There's no true church on the earth. And by the time we get to the 1838 account, we have what I think is Joseph Smith taking his own thoughts and putting them into the mouth of God. And I think that's really significant because once we have this example of Joseph Smith having his own thoughts in the 1832 account show up in the mouth of God in the 1838 account, then that, that opens wide the door to understanding what's going on with his translations, with his revelations, and with his teachings, which may be very much the same thing that he's taking his own thoughts and instantiating them, to use a $5 word, in Revelation and instantiating them in his translation projects, including the book of Abraham. Yeah, it seems as though with as many contradictions or subtractions and additions that are happening across the four accounts, it seems as though the most rational conclusion would be that he is making it up and he's embellishing the story at a bare minimum. 
as time goes on. So let's get into some of these arguments. I was looking around the room because I, I was pulling off various books that should have spoken about the first vision account, 1832 account, and don't because we'll need some of those later on. But let's start off with the LDS Gospel Topics essay. Uh, Maven, do you have that? Is that it right there? Perfect. So um, so essentially, if Maven, will you do a control F? And will you look up the words can be read? If you just, yeah, if you just do a control F and do a search in the website, and you've already got it there. Look at that. So I want to note here certain phrases that the LDS Gospel Topics essay uses and to talk about those for a moment. So the first one, it says the outlier is Joseph Smith's 1832 account, which can be read to refer to one or two personages. There are certain words that people Here's use Joseph. when it's 18. Oop, I don't know what that was. Um, if, if somebody says can be, and then notice just below there, may have. Uh, Joseph Smith's 1832 account then may have concentrated on Jesus Christ, the bearer of forgiveness. Then the next line, another way of reading the 1832 account is that Joseph Smith referred to two beings, both of whom he called Lord. Notice the church is con always trying to create a space right behind the most reasonable, rational conclusion, which is the critics, and trying to open up multiple avenues for other ways to see things, but which by their own language is less reasonable and less rational. And they want the believer not to pick up on it, but you and I are going to pick up on this kind of stuff easily when we sense that they're essentially going like, yeah, I mean, it sounds like there wasn't two beings, but, you know, another way to, to read it would be that, you know, the Lord God opened up the heavens and then he saw the Lord meaning Jesus. And you can sense that like, that's the weaker argument, but that's really all they have. And they do it over and over and over again. Um, an another one we can go to is um, Maven. If you'll go to the memory and the first vision uh, with Stephen Harper, we'll get into how various entities, Dan whether Vogel it's has asked, oops, whether it's Dan Peterson, which we'll get to in a moment, whether it's Stephen Harper, who we'll start off with here and then finish with, and then also Brad Wilcox kind of throws his hat in the ring too um, to give his commentary on the first vision. But I want you to notice what he does here, and he does the same old thing that David Bednar did um, with the no homosexuals in the church. Um, Dan Vogel has asked, how, how certain can we be that he tells us the experience as he had it at the time? Mm -hmm. It's a good question, but it's, it's not the best question in my judgment. Um, the best question or the one we can really get at is, what do the accounts tell us about how he experienced the vision over time? Yeah. Or, right, because we have one from 1832 and a 35, 38, 42, we can get at how does he experience this vision as his life goes by? How does he interpret yeah. it? Yeah. So first off, notice he changes the question. It's the age-old trick that apologists seem to do and LDS leaders seem to do. But Dan Vogel is asking the question of how can we trust Joseph Smith if everything's changing? How do we know which account is really the way it happened? And Stephen Harper, again, to his credit, he's a historian by trade. He doesn't want to deal in the things that you can't know. He wants to deal in the things that we can know and the things we can know is what did Joseph Smith think was important to share in the very moments and time in which he shared each of those first vision accounts, not what happened in the 1832, not, let me say it differently, not what happened in 1820 that he's relaying in 1832. And I think Dan is really getting to the heart of the matter. And Stephen just wants to sweep that question under the rug and move on with these two kids who don't know any better and don't know what tough questions to ask. But the reality is if somebody is sharing a version of an event in their life and that version changes all the time, it brings into question that person's credibility. Now, Stephen doesn't want to address Joseph Smith's credibility. Instead, he wants to go to another question, which really doesn't matter to any of us at all, which is how did Joseph Smith feel in 1832, in 1835? What was he thinking? What was he wrestling with? What was on his mind? What was bothering him? 
1838 and 1842, because Stephen would like to, you to shift your focus to whatever first vision account is in front of you. Let's wrestle with what Joseph was thinking about in that moment and why he might have shared the things that he did. It's a complete distraction. It's a complete sleight of hand. And again, I just always, my ears always perk up anytime I hear somebody inside the church take someone else's question and change it. Uh, any thoughts from you, RFM? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, the essential problem here is that we have an individual giving four variant stories over years. The problem is, is that the normal person is going to look at that and say, that is an indicator that this person is not telling the truth. It's not just a normal person who would do it. This is what happens every day in courts across the United States of America and probably beyond that. There is this idea that is in the rules of evidence about prior inconsistent statements. So if Joseph Smith in 1843, or let's say it's 1842, and he's getting up and he's in a court of law and he's testifying and he's testifying as to what's in the 1842 account, okay? Or you can put him in 1838. It is always admissible that in 1832, he had a different account. It's a prior inconsistent statement. And those are admissible specifically for purposes of impeaching the witness. And you know what impeaching the witness is. That means showing that the witness is not telling the truth, that the jury cannot trust this witness's credibility because you give inconsistent statements, you're not credible. And I have to laugh when apologists say, well, this is what we expect. We expect somebody who's telling the truth to give inconsistent statements. They actually make that argument, Bill. You've probably heard them. I know I have. Everybody who has anything to do with law enforcement or the courts or I guess real life even, maybe if they had kids, knows that if you give one story here and another story over here and it's not consistent, you are not telling the truth. And by the way, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, this story is more likely to be true or this story is more likely to be true. It usually means none of it's true. Yeah, or at least the witness is not credible enough to trust anything coming out of their mouth, right? Right. I mean, that's the old lawyer question. When you got someone who has inconsistent statements, okay, you've got a defendant on the stand, or it could be a different witness, but let's say it's a defendant who's on the stand, and they've just testified to the jury something different than what they told somebody else, like to the police or somebody else who's already testified. The question is, okay, so Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Defendant, were you lying then, or are you lying now? Yeah. And I want to point out that Stephen Harper right here is being myopic. Uh, Maven, will you continue to play this audio for just a moment? So for this one, I think, I think that's the whole clip for this one. Oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe Um, he forgot his glasses on. That's okay. There is, what he ends up doing is he says that, um, let me see if I got it here. Um, He says there isn't any evidence that Joseph Smith manipulated his story. And he's talking about the first vision. And I just want to recognize, RFM, you you know this, which is maybe not the first vision, but there are certainly, there certainly is evidence that Joseph Smith um, seems to be manipulating his story. Again, the most rational conclusion, if I'm allowed to add a little conjecture and a little bit of allowances, Richard Bushman from Rough Stone Rolling. What is, what is the point he makes? The point Richard Bushman makes is that he likes the 1832 account the best. And by like, I mean he uh, assigns it priority because it's the earliest account. It's in Joseph Smith's own handwriting. Yeah. And so he he I believe he expresses the belief that that is the actual best account of what really transpired in the Grove in 1820. Yeah, that's true. But what I'm asking is about priesthood restoration. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Priesthood restoration. Um, I think you're asking the wrong question, Bill. I think the question we need to ask is why did Joseph Smith have to wait till 1834 to get the priesthood in 1829? Yeah, so Richard Bushman in Rough Stone Rolling says that it seems as though from the data that the priesthood restoration was a late insertion into an earlier narrative when it really hadn't happened. And of course, Bushman leans on faith and says, I'm going to go with faith and that's the direction I'll go. But from his scholarly point of view, he says it appears as though 
uh, the priesthood rest restoration is a late thing. And you and I, we've had these conversations before where we've talked about that particular subject. And it's the idea that as Joseph Smith's own theology inside his head is changing, the Book of Mormon is being edited and revamped in its grammar and uh, the kinds of singular or plural uses of God and things like that are also being edited. Um, David Whitmer reports in his thing, I think it's All Believers in Christ. Is that the name of it? An address to all believers in Christ? Yeah. He he makes mention that he had never heard anything about priesthood restoration and that it's years later that it's being inserted in. So while Stephen Harper's myopic view that the first vision doesn't appear to be manipulated, if we take all of the extent uh, sources and bring them together, we get a different story, which is on other issues, Joseph Smith certainly appears to be manipulating and altering and embellishing his theology and the sacred text of the Book of Mormon, which was supposed to be the most correct book on earth, and seems to be manipulating it if we just take the most rational conclusion like Bushman seems to indicate. I think I understand your point now. Sorry for not understanding okay. it before where you were going. But uh, yeah, the way I would say that is that with Joseph Smith, we have what appears to be an example, a documented example of his creating a miraculous experience with Peter, James, and John appearing to him in 1829 that he doesn't tell it to anybody, even his closest associates, such as uh, Thomas Marsh, uh, Mar uh, David Whitmer, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. And then all of a sudden in 1834 or so, he starts talking about this happened back in 1829 when Peter, James, and John appeared to me. So even Richard Bushman, who is trying to put the best spin on it, while still, you know, putting out the warts, I got to give him credit for that, and rough stone rolling. Uh, he's certainly very knowledgeable about Joseph Smith, but he's up front saying, I'm a believing uh, member, and I want to try and address it this way. Even he says, this really, uh, this kind of, this looks like it was made up and then uh, retrofitted to 1829 or backdated to 1829. So if we've got a situation where we have an individual where we have one example of his doing this, creating a miraculous experience and then backdating it for whatever purposes he has in doing that. Yeah. Then we should not be surprised to find other places where the same individual does the same thing. Yeah. And this movement from just the Lord to um, there being Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in the grove also coincides with a Book of Mormon in the first edition, which seems to be a very Trinitarian uh, kind of Orthodox Christian view. And then over the course of its later editions, slowly becomes a matching text to that same theology of two beings. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, if we're not myopic, then, and we take all the sources in uh, into our view and try to take the collective view, there is plenty of room to see that Joseph Smith is manipulating these stories and these narratives. Right. The other point about Richard Bushman, and he's not the only one who does this, who puts uh, primacy on the 1832 account of the first vision. I think that is a difficult position to maintain logically mm -hmm. because if you maintain that that is what happened, that he saw one being and he asked for forgiveness, got forgiveness, then you also have to, I think, admit that later on, Joseph Smith is telling the same story, but embellishing it, right? Yeah. Which he's adding a person, he's adding, he's adding another person in the vision, he's adding Satan, he's adding a bunch of angels in 1835, all these things that are not in the 1832 account of the first vision. So if the 1832 account of the first vision is the correct one, then what do you do with all these other things that Joseph Smith makes up and adds to the account later? In my view, the fact that he makes up stuff later doesn't mean the first account he gives is the correct one. What it does is it calls into question that account just as much as the later accounts. Yeah. If if I think Joseph Smith is tricking us at any point, how do I know at which points he's tricking us? Yeah. If you yeah. lie about small things, you'll lie about big things. Yeah. That's Heavenly Father, and Jesus saying. Christ, and Satan and angels is a pretty big thing, huh? It's a big thing. All right. So there's that. Um, let's pull up, Maven, now the uh, the episode of Mormon Land, and let's talk for a moment about, uh, about that. Uh, do you have that handy? 
And I just want, before you push play, I just want to note listeners, notice how many allowances. I don't know which scholar this is. It's either Matt Groh or Spencer McBride. Uh, I don't know their voices well enough to pick them apart, but that's the two historians. And they're both very faithful and very much uh, massaging the story into as faithful a telling as possible. But notice, whichever one it is, notice the words they use and the allowances they make for all the possible things that could be perhaps outside the most rational thing it probably is. And this might be a little bit quiet, um, so you might need to turn it up a bit. Yep. Jesus, right? Oh. Uh, but the Sorry, start over. So the 18, I think it's 1832 account, or maybe some of the others that says that Joseph says he saw Jesus, right? Uh, but the 1838 account at least obviously says he saw God, the Father, and Jesus, um, which has real meaning to Latter-day Saints, of course. Right. That's a really big difference in, in some respects. It's sort of like it's sort of like he's, he seems to leave that a really big detail out in that yeah. one telling. How, how do you explain that? What that seems to be one of the points that that people point to when they when they're the skeptics and others who might yeah. criticize these accounts. Yeah, well, I, so in the 1832 account, he says um, that the the Lord opened the heavens. He, he saw the Lord, and then the Lord speak sp spoke to me. So he doesn't say Jesus. He he uses the word uh, the the terminology of Lord, uh, and and some people thought well maybe he's maybe even there he's some people in between two beings, um, or perhaps he's just focused perhaps. on the. The, the, the purpose of that account is to talk about the sense of a personal forgiveness of sins. And, and perhaps he's speaking perhaps. of the being who delivers that message uh, to him. Or perhaps it's one of these things perhaps. where uh, in the record that he prepares for publication, he's, he's more explicit uh, as, as, as time goes on. Yeah. So here you've got, and again, I'm always bothered. I noticed this with the Book of Abraham gospel topic essay. The church and its defenders are often trying to create multiple possible explanations. And the reality is anytime your ears pick up and your brain senses that the church is trying to give multiple explanations, the reality is almost assuredly that no explanation is that damn good. Um, because if they had one good explanation, it would be the explanation. It would be the thing they go with, right? And so in this instance, notice the, again, that historian, perhaps it's this and perhaps it's that, and maybe this happened. And you can start to sense that really they don't feel good about any of the answers that they're giving. Um, let's see here. And then um, I want to give some time over to you, RFM. So this is the part where um, we've got a little clip with Dan Vogel and, and Dan Peterson, and then the part with uh, where Stephen Harper makes the argument about embarrassment and rejection. Yeah, so uh, you're going to go to that clip now? Uh, we can. Do you want to play the clip first of Vogel? Uh, yeah. Can I set it up? Yeah, please. By the way, Dan Vogel's watching. He doesn't know we're going to use this clip, but we had it set up for when he and Brent Metcalf were on the show a few weeks ago. We did. We ran out of time. It was such an incredible show, and so we didn't get to this, but it fit in here. And this is a segment of an interview that was broadcast on a – TV show of some sort in Salt Lake City back in 2004 in August. And I think this is the first and last time Dan Peterson's ever appeared publicly to debate anybody. And it may have to do with this experience. But it is this exact idea that one of the apologetics is, well, look, it's not that big a deal. OK, he didn't mention the father. Big deal. He mentions him later. He mentions Jesus. That's close enough for government work. And this is the argument that Dan Peterson is making. And Dan Vogel does a mic drop line on him, which you'll get to see here. I don't know, but I do know that there's room for skepticism uh, about Joseph Smith and about his story, whether he saw God or whether he spoke to angels. When a person changes their story over time, it causes you to doubt if that story is true. For example, the first vision. When he told the first vision story in 18... It's in his own hand, and it says that only Jesus appeared to him in that in that account. Years no, later, it does not. It <laughs> says Jesus appeared to him. Okay, yes, but the vision account Jesus did change. It, the vision account did change. Yeah, right. I mean, there, my, there, there, there's there's Mormon scholarship. Of sure, the, the, sure. My my accounts of events in my life changes uh, change. I 
you tell tell it different ways, you tell it to different audiences, you emphasize different things. If I say I went to also see John, I might say to somebody else who I saw okay. Frank and John. So you, you say that the, that the accounts change, but they are consistent. I think there, can, there are a few areas that I see as relatively trivial of inconsistency, but overall consistent. Okay. Yeah. Back well, to, go ahead. I don't regard uh, telling your first vision story if uh, God, the Almighty, appeared ne standing next to Jesus, his son, as trivial. Boom! Yeah. So Dan tries to make this argument, right, that it's no big deal. Like, okay, he, he didn't mention God. So what? So what? So what? I mean, it's kind of just a little, a little detail. Not, it's not trivial that the creator of the freaking universe showed up to talk to you and to introduce his son. I know seeing God the Father would seem to be about the most untrivial detail that could possibly be imagined. Let me tell you something. Again, one of the tricks that apologists do is they, they say the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And it's this reminder that just because you think something with your sensibility of 2022 doesn't mean that somebody in the 1800s would operate based on the same type of thinking or uh, cognitive mechanism. But the reality is, RFM, whether, whether the past is different, whether it's a foreign country or not, if I saw Heavenly Father and you saw Heavenly Father, we would go the rest of our life if someone asked us to say, say that experience. There's no ifs, ands, or buts we would say that we saw Heavenly Father. We wouldn't go, like, oh, dang it, I forgot. I, I left him out, you know? I just, I didn't say that, darn me, you know? Um, that's not real. It, when something is as non-trivial as Vogel just said, it seems like it's a big deal. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that, on that clip? No, except I just love that clip at Dan Vogel looking absolutely spectacular. He looks so handsome. Yeah, he still he does, aged, actually. He's aged he's, well, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Yeah. yeah, I'm 43, and I look worse than he does. <laughs> I've got a huge man crush on the Vogelmeister. Yeah, yeah. Whatever supplements he's taking, they're working. <laughs> All right. And now, if uh, you want to run us through this um, Harper apologetic argument in regards to Joseph's rejection and embarrassment. Biography. So the 1835 memory is really cool. And I think one of the most telling things about it is it doesn't seem to cause Joseph Smith the psychological need to reconcile with or deal with that Methodist minister's rejection. So one of the things I argue in the book is that the 1832 memory is an effort to make good with, or at least not offend the, the minister or the, the whole world the minister represents. And that Joseph isn't very satisfied with his memory as a result of that effort. And then I argue that the 1838 memory is an effort to take that minister head on. This is Joseph in the world. Is that all of it? Maybe. I was going to add you in and see if you. It's not supposed to be, but I don't know. Maybe there's something else going on. I apologize. But that's all that I have like loaded up. Um, Sorry, I mean, guys. No, no, no. That's, that's okay. okay. That's probably plenty for our purposes. Yeah, yeah. Because what Run he's saying is, what he's trying to do is he's trying to account for Joseph Smith not mentioning God the Father in the 1832 account of the first vision because he's still reeling from the trauma inflicted upon him by having mentioned it to a local minister back when he was 14 years old and getting a, a response that it was all ridiculous and that that never happened and what a dumb kid you are, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's why. He doesn't, and this is his position. It's this uh, this in, this trauma that's in, been induced upon Joseph Smith, and I think that that's this is starting to get a little bit desperate. By the way, um, I don't know if I mentioned it to you, Bill, but as I've been reviewing and immersing myself in this first vision apologetic material, and it seems that Steve Harper has sort of taken the lead. He's sort of become uh, the John Gee of the uh, first vision apologetics. He right? is. Yeah. He's, he's just he's there. He's doing he's writing his books. He's doing the interviews. But I start feeling the same way that I do when I read the book of Abraham apologetics. We've already talked about this. The book, there's thousands of pages of book of Abraham apologetics that are written for one reason and one reason only. And it's because the translation doesn't match the papyrus. OK, if it did, 
you could argue that in one page, probably yeah. one paragraph, boom, it's done. Thousands of pages are necessary to argue why it is that that doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It seems like uh, apologetics has been a decades long attempt to show why something isn't what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, and I'm just saying, I, I'm starting, I get that feeling when I'm starting to, to read Stephen Harper and listen to him mostly because it's just all this stuff and it's not even easy to follow because I'm not sure it's strictly logical, but it's something to say in order to respond to an issue that really shouldn't have to be addressed because the issue shouldn't be there because the issue itself is what makes it look like it's a story. And so we have to go on and on and on explaining why it is that it's not what it looks like. No, it's something else. Now, Joseph Smith is traumatized by the reception of the story to this minister that he tells when he's 14. By the way, the first time we find out about that minister and the reception is, I believe, in 1838. Yep. In the 1838 account of the first page. And I'm not aware of anything earlier that talks about this. Yeah. And I'm sure that uh, Dan Vogel will correct me if I'm wrong about that. So... 1832. Now, I know that when you're 14 years old and you're sharing something that's personal to somebody that you look at as an authoritarian figure and you get a negative response, yes, that can be crushing. That can have an impact on you. But we're not talking about an account of Joseph Smith when he's 14 mm -mm. or 15 mm -mm. or 16 mm -mm. or 17 or 18. This is 12 years later. He's 27, he's I Right. 26, I think. 26. 14 plus 12. Perfect. Right. 26, I think. So 26 years old. And he has already, if we go just from the Mormon perspective, which Stephen Harper would uh, agree to. He's he being has, myopic again, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's the word of the day. Say the magic word and a duck will fly out of your pants. So, boom. Um no, he, this is a, 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 an individual, Joseph Smith, who is not 14 anymore. He's not a kid anymore. He has received multiple angelic visitations. He has received a sacred record written on gold place. He has translated it by the gift and power of God. He's established the church of Jesus Christ, restored in these last days in 1830. He's gone to receive a, a fistful of revelations from God. He sent people on missions. It's now 1832. By the time he writes the 1832 account of the first vision, which fails to mention the appearance of Heavenly Father. Yeah. And I think it's strange credulity to believe that he's still somehow responding psychologically to the trauma induced by a minister from 12 years earlier who just poo-pooed a story and said, I don't like it. It's not like he beat the crap out of him or anything. He just says, that's dumb. And that he's got to now respond to that by not mentioning God the Father appearing. And I had suggested to you while we were talking that, you know, it's strange that section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the vision of the kingdoms of glory, what, right? What year was that written? 1832. That, Coincidentally okay. enough. By the way, today is the anniversary of the receipt of that revelation. It was February Ooh. 16th, 1832. Today is February 16th. Tender mercies. I... It, it can't be a coincidence that can't. we're talking about that on the very same day of the year. We didn't plan that either. No, the odds against that are one in 365, I think. So yeah. therefore, this is a miracle, right? Mm. Okay. So, but it was uh, February of 1832. So it's around five, maybe months before Joseph Smith sits down to write the 1832 account of the first vision. And in this, this uh, section 76, at two different locations, Joseph Smith says he sees God and Jesus Christ standing on his right hand. Now, that suggests that Joseph Smith is comfortable with the idea of God and Jesus Christ being separate beings. Okay, and there you've got it, section 76, verse 20, and now we're scrolling away from what I was going to read. 23. There's 23 as well. So it's 20 and 23. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father. And verse 20, was that what you had before? Yeah. You'd go the yeah. And we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father and received of his fullness. So those uh issues are there. Now I had a very long conversation 
with someone who knows a lot more about Mormonism than I do uh, last night, and that was Brent Metcalf. And his view is that that's not necessarily the case, mainly because people who believed in the Trinity at that time, who were not Mormon, uh, would use similar expressions. Of course, using the language from, what is it, the martyrdom of Stephen at the end of Acts chapter 7, where he looks up and he says he sees uh, uh, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and that gets everybody so mad they throw rocks at him and kill him. So that's a possibility. However, what Britt Metcalf did say was, yeah, well, regardless of that, this argument from Stephen Harper about the trauma from the minister lasting for 12 years is ridiculous. And what Britt Metcalf said was that he thinks that Section 76 itself was incredibly radical. And it was, contextually speaking, in history. There were members who left the church over this revelation because they were steeped so much in one heaven, one hell, that this blew their minds. Brigham Young even said that he wrestled with this for like two years before he could wrap his head around it and agree to it. So Joseph Smith is not averse to presenting radical doctrines. And there's another radical doctrine that he introduces in Section 76, though we usually think of it in terms of Section 132 at the end of his career, but this is toward the beginning of, of his career. And this is verse 58 in Section 76, where he begins talking about the divination of human beings. Hey, Maven, is Maven doing that or are you, Bill? I'm doing that. Maven, could you come on and read this? My voice is getting tired. What what verse did you say, RFM? 58. 58. If memory serves. I'm kind of going without a net here. Okay, 58 says, Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Thank you. And oh, could you read 57 to lead into it too? Oh, <laughs> Um, and are priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten Son. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Blasphemy. How dare him? Thank you so no much. Yeah. <laughs> and so what do you think of that, Maven, that in 1832, the beginning of 1832, Joseph Smith is already intimating, if not outright stating, that human beings if they do everything they're supposed to do, can become gods. That he's, he's not so worried about fitting in. No, he ever was. I, I think that's a great understatement. I love the way you put that. No, Joseph Smith was not worried about fitting in. He And five months later, according to Stephen Harper, he's so concerned about this minister that he's going to omit the appearance of God the Father from his first vision account. I think way, that is unlikely in the extreme. By the way, at this point, they're not in Palmyra, New York anymore. No, correct. Right? Correct. He's not even anywhere near where he has to worry about what this minister even thinks. Yes. He's got his own people. He's done lots of courageous things. He's the mouthpiece of God on earth. The last thing we're worried about here is offending some minister hundreds of miles away. Right. And so I appreciate uh, Stephen Harper's uh, trying to be creative to come up with some kind of resolution for this thorny issue that's presented by the 1832 account, but I think here he's barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. All right, now let's jump into Brad Wilcox really quickly, and then we'll run the conclusion down and get uh, some calls in the queue uh, as we run if down the end. If he were lying. Yep, oh. yep. Uh, so let me uh, change the screen here. Uh, Brad, this is the recent thing from Alpine, Utah, where he got into a bunch of trouble, but what got left out because there were so many other pressing things that he said that were unhealthy, uh, he is trying to deal with the first vision here. And I can't understand the point he makes in light of the 1832 account. If he were lying, then he would have said what everybody wanted to hear. He would have said, I saw God and God and Jesus are one being. And God and Jesus are spirit. That's what people wanted to hear. That's what they would have believed. And yet he didn't say that. Isn't he said that... God and Jesus are separate beings with physical, tangible, perfected bodies. Whoa, that is so far out of the realm of believability that Joseph Smith proves himself either a horrible liar I mean, he was bad at it, or a speaker of truth. 
You see, I think Brad Wilcox is be, being too hard on Joseph Smith. I think he needs to give Joseph a break. I don't think give Joseph was Joseph that bad a, a liar. Give brother Joseph a break. So, <laughs> I don't think he was that bad a liar. Do you think Brad Wilcox doesn't know about the 1832 account of the first vision? This man knows perfectly well the 1832 account of the first vision. He is not only a member of the general young men's presidency, he is also a mm -hmm. professor of ancient scripture at mm. Brigham Young University. So he is a professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University. And he says if Joseph Smith were going to do what was acceptable in the day, he would have said something like, the Lord opened the heavens and I saw the Lord. Exactly. <laughs> this is just remarkable to me because, you know, a, a while back I did an episode over at RFM called Arguing Against the Evidence. And I pointed out where Joseph Fielding Smith, before 1965, when he's writing for the Improvement Era, makes this identical argument, saying that if Joseph Smith were lying, he would have said that there was only one being who appeared to him, because that's what everybody wanted to hear. And the fact that he said two people appeared to him, we know he's not lying because nobody would have believed that at his time. Now, first off, I think that's a gross generalization, and it does not apply to the Second Enlightenment, which I'm not an expert in. But the, the Second Enlightenment has to do with people having the liberty of interpreting the Bible according to their own interpretations. And they were uh, many different kinds of interpretations. They were not limited only to the idea of one God and one God only that could appear at any one time. Okay, so that's one thing. So I think that's probably not correct historically. Once again, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But even if it were, even if it were, what he's saying is if Joseph Smith were a liar, he would have said that only one being appeared to him. Yeah, I mean, Wilcox says if Joseph Smith only saw one being, he would have come out of the grove and declared he only saw one. Isn't that exactly how the first edition of the Book of Mormon's theology states it? And isn't that exactly what the 1832 First Vision account supports? <laughs> yes. And when Joseph Fielding Smith made that argument, he had the 1832 account of the First Vision locked in his safe. He knew it existed. He was arguing against, yeah. arguing against the evidence. And this individual, Brad Wilcox, he knows perfectly well the 1832 account of the First Vision. He know it references only one being appearing. And yet he's going to make this argument knowing that his argument is completely undercut by its very existence and that his logic that he's putting forth in this argument shows that Joseph Smith was, in fact, telling people what it was that they would have expected to hear. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Anyway, I am, I'm just flabbergasted because either he's – Either he just completely had a complete brain fart and forgot all about the 1832 account, or he's trying to perpetuate to the youth in that building that there is still just the 1838 account and there's nothing else to, to go off of, right? Like it, 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 just, it just seems deceptive to tell them something when the very historical data point we're talking about absolutely contradicts his entire statement. He's doing what... I used to do as an apologist and what apologists still frequently do today is they make an argument that sounds good, but it is predicated on your audience, not knowing the evidence that undercuts your argument. Yeah. It was and he's talking to a bunch of kids. It's a very myopic point of view. He's sharing, isn't it? <laughs> We're not done. Myopic indeed. Yeah. If we take all of the extent sources and put them all together, um, we get a whole much, a much more fuller view. Um, but Brad doesn't seem to want to do that. All right. Last little bit here, and this will take a few minutes. We might go a touch late tonight. Um, if we can start to play the, uh, ending part of Stephen Harper with these two youth and, and we'll just stop at various points, but the very first cut is, um, I think it runs from the beginning to one hour, 12 minutes and 50 seconds. So did you have that also, Bill? Oh, I do I can, have it, but yeah. I don't have it stopped. And I just want to make sure you have control over when you're starting and stopping it. Let me, let me do that. So let me go to one, 
112, 15, 112, 15. Put this up on the screen. Ta da. Whoop. Sorry, here we go. Okay. Starts right now. I'm not hearing any sound. Um, Oops, sorry. Let me, sound? Yep, let me put it back up. a thoughtful member who's struggled with battle lines yeah. of first vision. Mm -hmm. um, for Give me a second. Sorry, I am raising. State. Uh, it's right there. I have sort of pragmatic advice as we, I think, draw near to the close sure. of this discussion for, um, for a thoughtful member who's struggled with uh, faith and maybe some of their uh, struggles have centered around the first vision. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this feeling of uh, betrayal, but even potentially if you've, uh, you, you felt like, you know, it was disingenuous what you, right. what you heard growing up, but even once you move past that, a, you know, I think a reasonable person could look at all the different accounts and have trouble tr trying to reconcile them enough to say there's objective truth behind it. Notice he says the exact opposite of fair, which is that it's reasonable to come to the conclusion to be bothered by the fact that these accounts don't match. And while Fair Mormon says no reasonable person can be bothered by that, notice that the stance here is that they can be bothered. And I simply want to say the other thing is notice the host is validating that this material to an average person could be troubling. Right. It's an incredible thing when reality intrudes upon a conversation of this sort. And I give yeah. him kudos for bringing this up. Yeah. All right. So here's uh, Harper's explanation. Mm -hmm. And so do you have, do you have advice for someone who's looking to reconcile or who's looking to regain faith or mm -hmm. to, or even not necessarily to convince themselves of, um, of a particular truth, but to find a place that's, that's comfortable for them? Yeah, sure. Boy, we could go on. Here, yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> we'll start a new episode. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so one thing that, is common in situations like this is that people are making assumptions that they don't know are assumptions. Mm. And if, if your assumption gets overturned and you assumed it was, you know, the bedrock of your faith, or even if it was the bedrock of your faith, then that's, that's a, that leads to trouble disruption yeah. of your memory. Yeah. Um, and that's when you, that's not the only explanation for these cases, but that's a common one. So one good thing to do is to ask yourself, what do I know and how do I know it? Evaluate your uh, epistemology, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Figure out, I mean, peel back all the layers. What yeah. do I know and how do I know it? So here I just want to notice, this is one of those moments where Apologists are continually adding in assumptions and conjecture and allowances and perhaps and maybes and what ifs. And the moment you as the critic have any level of assumptions or conjecture or allowances, even if it's the conclusion that requires the least amount of allowances and the least amount of conjecture, notice he stands ready to pick you apart. What do I know and how do I know it? He only wants the critic to be able to rely on the absolute facts. Meanwhile, their side of the ball game gets to play uh, loose and gets to bend the rules at every turn. And I think this is such a great point that you're making, Bill. It's one that had not occurred to me, and I'm glad you're bringing it up here and using this as an example. I've got to tell you, when I'm listening to this uh, Stephen Harper talk here, uh, I'm having trouble understanding where he's going. I think I understand his words, but I have no idea what it means. Maybe he'll finish the thought. But right now I'm getting the impression watching him that he's doing what it is I'm doing when you're looking for something on the show. And I'm trying to come up with something to fill the time until you're ready. Instead, he's sort of spouting words to come up with something to fill the time until an idea occurs to him that hopefully will answer the question in some kind of rational way. Yeah, and you'll find by the end, he even agrees that he didn't do a very good job of it. So... Uh, let's continue this. And this gets worse. It doesn't, um, I, I'm a little tired. This is uncharitable, perhaps. I don't mean for it to be, but <laughs> let's stop blaming the church, right? Mm. 
I don't know who we even mean when we say that. Do we mean the volunteer teachers? Joseph Fielding Smith should know better, but nobody told them either. Mm -hmm. um, let's be more charitable. I'm in being uncharitable. I'm asking for people to be more charitable yeah. toward people in the past mm -hmm. who did the best they could with what they had. All right. Uh, I almost said something that had to be bleeped on that one, Bill. I, 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 this got my blood boiling. This got I'm me. The same, uh, I'm having the same reaction right here. It's visceral. Yeah, it, it's getting, I'm feeling some sort of violation inside of me because what he's doing is he's blaming the victim. He, he first off says like, come on, give me a break. Don't, don't blame the church. Well, let me start off here. Marvelous work in a wonder, LeGrand Richards. Love that book. Talks about the restoration, divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon, uh, the first vision. Anything about the 1832 account in there? Uh, I'm guessing no, because it was written no. before 1965. Yeah. Well, this one's after 1965. How about the Institute Manual in the college curriculum for the restoration? If um, that's written after 1965, that will definitely have it in there. Let's see here. Religion 341, 342, and 343. This is... Three semesters of college study on church history specific to the uh, modern church restoration. Um, the year on this, let's see here, what year this is, 1989 and then redone in 1993. That's about an inch and a half thick. You would think that a college uh, kid studying the restoration would learn about the 1832 First Vision account, wouldn't you? It's in there, isn't it? It's not in there, RFM. Are you kidding? Not in there. No, Joseph Fielding Smith, the very guy who hid the first vision account in his vault, didn't he write a book? It was a it was a red cover, um, about four inches thick, maybe three inches thick. That was something about the history of the church. Essentials in church history. Yeah, is the 1832 account in there? No, no. I brought this up with Brent last night too. <laughs> yeah, so he's the very guy who hid it. So. Two things are wrong here. One is that I absolutely sure as hell can blame the church for me not knowing about the 1832 account unless I was one of uh, 300 people who, you know, if out of every 300 people, I was the one guy who went and dug out everything and eventually I learned it, but it was nowhere accessible in my ward library. It was nowhere accessible in my church curriculum. It was nowhere accessible in my magazines, unless you're going to count that 1970 article by James Allen or a brief little mention here or there. And by the way, they always point to that 1970. And, and I also should say, this is the point where you made that I, sh I should correct myself. I mentioned in an episode I did for Mormon discussion about a month ago that that was the kids magazine because it was the improvement era and the new era was the church's youth magazine the improvement era back in the day was the adult magazine. Thank you for correcting me on that, by the way. And um, so I made a mistake there. But by them pointing to that 1970 article, RFM, can you get that on the church's website? No. No. It's not anyone's fault but the church's fault. It is the church's fault. Like, you can't make the argument that, hey, guys, um, I have an uh, – expose on myself, but I'm not going to tell you this. You're never going to know this, but I've got it stored in a vault uh, three blocks away from my house at some storage facility that I'm not going to tell you about. And then blame you when you don't know what's in the freaking vault. Mormonism absolutely chose to convince all of us that the 1838 account was the account. It was the story by Joseph Smith about his first vision nobody cared to tell me otherwise. So if nobody tells you there's other information, how in the hell are you supposed to find it unless you're the one in a million, uh, you know, detective sleuths who just loves Mormon history so much that you read absolutely everything, including the freaking material they told you to stay away from to begin with. Right. Frequently what this ends up being is uh, blaming the member of the church for finding the stuff the church has been hiding from them. Yeah. And then the second problem is that he wants to offload this onto the volunteer teachers. Did you ever blame a volunteer teacher for not telling you the 1832 account of the first vision? Never. They're going off the correlated manuals. By the way, I think I said that wrong. I think I left out a knot. What they're saying is they're blaming the member for not finding the stuff the church has been hiding from them. 
Yeah. Yeah. The church hid it from you. And then it's your fault for not finding it. And then it's the, and if anybody's fault, it's the teacher's fault that didn't know about it either. Cause they're just like you. Everybody in my ward is just me. They have the same access to the same stuff. And I know sure as hell that nobody else in that ward that I went to knew anything about the 1832 account, because anytime I would say anything about this crazy Mormon stuff that they didn't know about, I'd have a bunch of them walk up to me afterward and, and second guess what I was saying. The, the church absolutely hit it. So for Stephen Harper to blame the volunteer teachers, if I can be blunt, it's bullshit. And he shouldn't be allowed to get a free pass in doing that. Somebody needs to hold him accountable for completely shifting the burden um, in whose fault this is. It absolutely is the church's fault. It's the curriculum writers, um, and they get their marching orders from the church. Uh, Leonard Arrington tried to dive into this stuff. He was let go. Joseph Fielding Smith had about 17 things hidden in his church history vault, including the seer stone, as you pointed out, as a paperweight on top of all of it. Um, There's so many things that are not available to the average member 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that it's absolutely the church's fault that none of us knew this stuff. I, I grew up in the church literally thinking the papyri translate the Egyptian papyri translated into the book of Abraham. And it never occurred to me that somebody might've taken a look at that and done something different with it. You know, Mm -hmm. what do you make of the fact bill that uh, Stephen Harper I think he's a really smart guy. I think he's probably a very nice guy. He seems very mild-mannered and soft-spoken, at least in all the interviews I've seen him. I've never met the gentleman. But what do you make of the fact that at this one point in the interview, and the only time I've ever seen him get upset, is when people are blaming the church for hiding this information from them when manifestly they have? What do you think accounts for that reaction on his part? He knows which side his uh, bread is buttered on. (laughs) Oh, my God. Company man. Stephen Harper is a company man. And Stephen Harper chooses his language carefully. He shifts the burden. He he offers fallacies. And he says a ton of bullshit so that you and I feel guilt and shame for not having figured it out when when the absolute blame lies at the very feet of the church and its leaders. Notice yeah. notice the one person or group he never mentions in any of that rhetoric. Who's that? Church leaders. Mm. Never. He he starts off by saying blame the church, but then he immediately goes to volunteer members. He doesn't want to mention church leaders at all. He sure as hell is hoping those kids don't ask anything about Joseph Fielding Smith in the cutout of the 1832 account. He wants to avoid that at all costs. Every 99.9% of members could have done nothing more than to believe the dominant narrative because that's the narrative they were told to believe and they were told not to trust any other information that said otherwise. Right. And if he, the only thing he says about the leaders is they're doing the best they can. Doing the, yeah, they're as transparent as they know how to be. Yeah. If he means they're doing the best they can to keep the members from finding out the stuff that's uncomfortable and that's messy and that's contradictory and that's challenging and that's not faith promoting, then I agree with him. Yeah. Thank God for the internet. Um, All right, let's continue. So let me say it another way. I'll I'll blame this on Dean Jesse, one of my heroes, Mm -hmm. one of the great scholars of Joseph Smith and especially of his first vision accounts. A decade or so ago, I asked Dean, what do you, why do you think I asked him the question you just asked? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, perhaps if people were more inclined to read, Mm. and what he meant by that is the vision accounts have been published for 50 years. The (laughs) true, they haven't been shouted from the housetops. Notice that little tiny little kind of gracious giving of saying like, yeah, we didn't really talk about it much, but, um, you know, it was there published 50 years ago. Yeah. And the 1832 account was first published in in 1965. Yeah. Oh, I, I think I'm echoing a bit here. Maybe I should just shut up. Try again. Is it doing it still? I don't hear you echoing. Testing one, two, three. Now it's clear. Thank you. Okay. So the, the 1832 account, the earliest account was first published in, in 1965. Strangely, the next account, the 1835 account, was not published until the following year in 1966. So prior to, I mean, I'm a kid. Is that 130 130 years later? Yeah. Well, whatever the math is, it's 1965 (laughs) for the 1832 account and 1966 for the 1830. I may have said that wrong. 
1865-1832 account, 66-1835 account. I think I got that right there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a long time. And what he's trying to say is after the church was forced to cough up these, uh, at least the 1832 account that had been hidden in a safe for decades by the church historian, also an apostle, also going to become the president of the church, Joseph Hilding Smith. What he's saying is the church stopped suppressing and hiding these documents. Let me put it this way. The church doesn't hide these documents after they got done hiding the documents. They haven't suppressed the documents since they got done suppressing the documents. Except for the ones they're still suppressing. Yeah, who the heck knows what those are? I don't know. William Platon diaries. Okay. I hear those so are coming they're... out soon. Yeah, they're they're finally going to see the light of day out of the vault inside uh, Salt Lake City's church headquarters. Yeah. All right, let's continue. <laughs> And I can't hear him now. I Oops, remember sorry, reading, let me back up. And there's a, actually a yeah. comment in the published for 50 years. The true, they haven't been shouted from the housetops, but they've been available. Um, and some people feel resentful of that. You know, why didn't they? I remember. Where were they available? In non-church approved sources. That this church told you not to read. Right. Right. <laughs> and there's actually a yeah, comment in the book yes, from a person saying, why don't we talk about this in general like I didn't conference? know to ask. I didn't, yeah. Yeah, I didn't. Notice what she just said. She picks up on the, on the big thing, which is I didn't know to ask. If I don't know it exists, how am I supposed to even know to ask to go see it? And when you've told me not to trust the sources that will tell me it exists and let me read it, how the hell am I supposed to find it? It sounds like he has a problem in his epistemology. epistemology. <laughs> knows there right so i'd like for i wish everybody had the privileges i've had i mm -hmm. studied the first vision accounts from milton backman the guy who wrote the book on it literally yeah. about the year i was born mm -hmm. so it's not that they've been under a bushel exactly it, not exactly i mean kind of under a bushel but not I exactly that Notice, i think it came out in the 1980s yeah let me check Notice he says, too, that his view is privileged. Like, he's shaming you for not having found it, but he acknowledges that he was in a privileged position to have found it. Right, and he's also tacitly admitting that he was in a, a situation where, unlike the vast majority of people, he had access to it because of his position with the church history department. I think that's what he's indicating there. Yeah, his his course curriculum with, with Backman uh, and then his privileged status within the church history department and training to be in that department. Yeah. So how can you make, how can you make other people feel bad when you acknowledge also that you were one of the lucky ones who had access to it? I don't know. He's kind of back and forth all over the issue and it is trouble. It's, it's hard to follow him except for the fact that every one of his answers, even though they sometimes are mutually contradictory all go one way toward the leaders are not to blame. Yeah, and he's about to tell everybody here uh, that he's going to admit that everyone didn't have that privilege. Mm -hmm. um, some of us didn't have that problem because we were taught all about them in the context of faith and uh, intellectual rigor. I just wish everybody could have that privilege. Yeah. And Well, they don't, Stephen. They Not didn't. in the church, they don't. They didn't. So why be such an ass to people over their pain and trauma when you self-admit that the only reason you knew was because you were in a privileged position and not everyone has that privilege? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I'm echoing because I think that the, um, the video is up, even if it's not playing. Now I'm not. But can we just remind me, Bill, if you would, what is the question he's responding to again? Uh, I don't even know at this point. Remember like, what the kid said? He said yeah, people no. feel betrayed. They feel like, you know, how do they make sense of this? If yeah, that was it. That was testimony. Yeah, that was the original question that this could bother people. So how do we make sense of it in a way that leads to faith? And so, um, all right, so let's do this next section. Yeah. So I guess I'm dancing in circles here, not really answering the question. There's no one simple good answer. To There's no one simple good answer. 
RFM, why would there be no one simple good answer? Because his position is wrong. His position is wrong. When he says there's no one good answer, he means from his perspective, his faithful perspective, that must support faith and must support the leaders. There's no one good, simple answer to do those things, which are his objectives. There is one simple good answer if that is not the conclusion that you're starting from and that must be maintained at all costs. Yeah, there is absolutely a good rational answer on the critical side. Uh, Joseph Smith made it up. All right, a few more segments here, and then we'll get out of here with a couple of phone calls. To it, but I hope people know it's going to be okay. Yeah. Lots of people have had this challenge, this disruption to their faith. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. and that's not the end. That's not. Yeah. It doesn't lead inevitably to hopelessness or despair or or giving away everything that I cherished. FYI, I think out of every hundred people that dive down the rabbit hole of Mormonism, I think it's not okay if if okay is meaning continued uh, membership and faith in the church. I think most people who are deconstructing um, at this point end up losing their faith. And so he says it's going to be okay. Well, it will be okay. Um, but most of the people are going to be okay because they stepped away and they regained their autonomy back and their freedom back. Um, but it is going to take some time for those people too. Yeah. He goes from dancing around in circles, which is what he admits he does to saying, there's no one simple good answer. And after acknowledging that to saying, well, it's going to be okay. Well, what <laughs> yeah, have you told right. us that we can base that opinion on that? It's going to be okay. Cause based on what you're saying, it doesn't sound like it's going to be okay. Yeah. And then this, then the female interviewer comes back in and admits that you had to go digging for this stuff. terrific resource Mm -hmm. Uh, faithisnotblind.org I think it is what you guys are doing is fantastic I appreciate it very much well I I had a better answer no that's a great answer and I I think that it's I think that we're seeing that the church is making such an effort to make it easier to find you know you don't have to really Mm -hmm. dig anymore is you you had to dig before you had to really go digging before you don't have to really go digging anymore you had to be on a treasure dig <laughs> to find it before. You would need some guardian spirits to help you. Yeah. But he, he actually says, I wish I had a better answer for you. This is Stephen Harper. He is the acknowledged expert in the church He's on the, the first vision right now. Today, he works in the church historian's office. He has the privileged position, which he's already said. If he doesn't have a good answer to that question, who does? Who the hell does? Nobody. So when those those questions come up, it'll be easier to have access. And I think yeah. it, toward the end of the book, you mentioned that the thing that's so incredible about memory is maybe not how quickly things are consolidated, but how quickly I'm going to skip ahead here just a little bit. That it was ever that will change so. our story yeah. a little bit. We are resilient. We are more resilient yeah. than we might think. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you'll notice from his answer, he says we are resilient, and and you think on the onset he's talking about we the people as members of the church that we are resilient, um, but that is not at all what he's saying. He's talking about the church itself. And I know it's common to think, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the sky is falling and we've never done this before. Sometimes people uh, can benefit from remembering 1837, right? Yeah. That was a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, for individuals, definitely... uh, and families can be devastating. So for individuals and families, they can be devastated. So who is he talking about as resilient? But uh, the church is resilient. The church. The church will roll forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, many, many, many millions of people will be blessed by it. Less and less every day. struggles along the way. I mean, this many is not unexpected stuff. This, well, everything we're going through, it's not unusual. Mm-hmm. It's not unexpected. And it's not uh, the end. It's yeah. not hopeless by yeah. any stretch. Yeah. So that's because our testimonies are impervious to facts. Yeah, their testimony is impervious to facts. It is resilient. That is his definition of resilience, I think. Yeah. The people are leaving in significant numbers. The church may be resilient in terms of funds in the stock market, um, and it, it, it and just existing for the fact, just for the sake of existing. 
But if surviving is something other than shrinking down, down into an ever lower and lower number of butts in the seats, then maybe it isn't as resilient as he's claiming. I will tell you, I cannot see coming away from watching this interview as a faithful member of the church who wants an answer to this question, who's being troubled by this question, or maybe even encountering the question for the first time, coming away from this, feeling good about the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll wrap up here with him kind of adding in his testimony, and he admits that his testimony is subjective. It's just it's just feelings inside his head. Is he doing this by telepathy, Bill? Listeners will say, oh, that's so cliche. That's so, I know I can. Yeah. It's true. Can you not hear it? It really is true that if we work really hard at Joseph Smith did not just pray about it, right? That four word summary that oversimplifies the wrestle, mm -hmm. rather yeah. his own accounts and the scriptures he gives to us, they talk about wrestling yeah. before God and wrestling with God. And that stuff really is true. It does pay off. Yeah. It leads us yeah. to a better, better place. And Thank like, you. what a beautiful message that whether or not you feel like you can ever come. So we can, we can end it there. Oh, actually another, I'm sorry. Well, there's one more minute knowledge about whether it happened or not. Like I, I love just the, that we can value that, that this idea that wrestling is okay and important and that we should be doing that and that God can reach you. I, I, I mean, whether or not the first vision happened, like if that's the message of the first vision, then like, isn't that true? You know, that just the yeah. message, the truth and the truth in the way that you that you described earlier in this very like whole way, you know, maybe not in a police report way. If you just can't ever yeah. get past that, we'll never have we'll never we'll never really be yeah. able to know that objectively. Then I think that there's some value in recognizing that there's it's beautiful that we right. accept the wrestle and that that message has been so meaningful that it's lasted 200 years. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know the first vision was true objectively. I know it subjectively. Yeah, I know it yeah. in my own self. I don't yeah. know it because we're out of five yeah. scientists approved it. Yeah. yeah. So he knows it subjectively. That's how he knows it. And his subjective knowing really isn't any different than elevation emotion that Jonathan Haidt says all of us humans feel. And uh, I'm trying to, uh, you can't know it, object he, to some extent he's right. You can't know it objectively in that you can't prove it with absolute proof. But what you can do is know that there are about 372 sticky issues and on all 372 of them, the data for the most rational conclusion is in the critic's favor. And so when you take the 20,000 foot view, and we'll get into this in a couple of weeks, when you take the 20,000 foot view, it becomes absolutely apparent that belief in Mormonism's story as it tells it, and that's always changing too, by the way, the belief in that is completely absurd. Yeah, I'm getting the sense here that objectivity, like patriotism, is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Yeah. yeah. By the way, um, if you're ever wrestling with God, I recommend the full Nelson. He falls for it every time. God in the full Nelson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So now we can wrap up here with a couple of phone calls. The fullness um, of the Nelson. The fullness of the Nelson. Yeah, that makes... Yeah, let's... There are lots of wrestling moves and... Uh, uh, a, a high level of training and mental gymnastics helps these guys out. Uh, let's see here. So um, it's going to take me two seconds. Any thoughts from you as we get ready to take yes. some phone calls? On uh, Steve Harper's mental gymnastics, he gets a 10.0, a 10.0, a 10.0, and a 6.3 from the East German judge. Ta-da. That joke dates itself. Let's see here. Um, yes. Now we're going to connect Roadcaster. I think we should start calling you Mr. Pink. And I think, whoop, shoot, shoot, shoot. Let's try this one more time. Do you want to be called Mr. Pink? You can call me Mr. Pink if you want. I can be the wonderful Mr. Limpet if you want me to be. Or even the incredible Mr. Limpet. The incredible Mr. Limpet. Yeah. Yeah. That was a no, you don't want to be Mr. Pink. I don't like that. Was a, that was a great, uh, great movie. Let's see here. I don't know if that's the line you're talking about. I was just. 
No, I'm doing Reservoir Dogs, baby. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I would pick a movie that I knew you knew and a little Tarantino action there. No, you're talking about that Don Knotts classic, The Incredible Mr. Limpet. Be careful with be careful what you wish for. No, be careful what you wish for. Wishes can come true. I think is the lyric in the song there. Anyway. Yeah, I think we've got Bob Crockett on the phone. No way, my pal, my yeah, buddy. Bob, is that you? That is me. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great, my friend. Hi, What's Bob. How are you mind? doing? Well, I'm doing fine. I'm, you know, I've got battles. I'm doing fine. I was uh, very interested in your topic today. Uh, I, I first learned of the First Vision conflicts uh, on my mission in the 1970s when I read uh, the Tanner's uh, magnum opus or big opus. Bob, and, uh, Bob. Then I went to P- Bob. Then I went to P- yes. Bob, what are yes. you doing reading the Tanner's anti-Mormon material on your mission? Well, a lot of people, a lot of missionaries had access to that um, that big book. It was uh, TypeScript and tell in uh, in ordinary uh, uh, typewriting TypeScript courier and. Uh, and we circulated it and read it. So I, I read all that stuff. Hey Bob, but I got a I got a question. I, um, I got a question for you. Yeah. Were the were the critics were the anti Mormons more honest about church history than the church was? Um, I would say no. The um the tanners were not professional writers and they uh intentionally ignored um, material that was uh, explanatory and focused just on critical material. And then the way they described it, the way they portrayed it, is they used a uh, particular emphasis. Okay. But I, I'm not calling about the Tanner's work. Oh. Uh, when I went to, then I went back to BYU after my mission, and I went to work for Milton Backlund. I was a research assistant for him, and he was also coincidentally later my branch president. And he re- he wrote a book, very well written book called The First. Now, have either <clears throat> the two of you ever read that book? I did in the 1980s. Is that when it came out, Bob, or is that a reprint? Well, it came out in the 1970s. It came out okay. uh, probably around 1974, 1975. Okay, because I didn't join the church till 78, so hopefully so, I'll be forgiven. So. Milton Backman was a professor professor of history at BYU, and he particularly focused his um, intellectual work on the Kirtland era, the Kirtland era, which this book has nothing to do with. But the first vision book was a very good explanation and reconciliation of the various conflicts in the first vision account, and it uh, responded to all the the Tanner's criticisms. Of the first vision, it mentioned all the particular uh, first vision accounts. The first vision book was kind of thin; it was maybe a hundred pages, because I mean, what can you say about it? But but thereafter, the new ensign or the new era, or the, I'm sorry, the the ensign and the new era quoted frequently from the from Backman's book. And there are occasional general conference addresses that uh, also cite back and forth. So, so at least since the 1970s, the church was not hiding anything with respect to the first vision. Um, now, does the ordinary member know about the Backman's book? Well, not necessarily, unless they check footnotes to general conference addresses. Um, was the first vision described? or discussed the, the reconciliations before 1975? Well, no. And Joseph Fielding Smith had a particularly uh, aggressive approach to portraying church history, and that's not to uh, not to examine any of the warts, which has changed. So uh, the church's uh, change in philosophy occurred in the 1970s. But this is a, this is a, a critical book. In the water, in the history of the church, is published by BYU. Had the endorsement of the, I mean, not the endorsement, but at least it was peer reviewed at the BYU level. So, I think the greater question is: 
is the church hiding information? And my response is, and 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 I think uh, our IFM knows that that I work for the church on a professional level, not a employment level. And my view is that the the ordinary general authority just doesn't know much about church history. They're car dealers or doctors or or investment bankers. But hey, hey, Bob, they never get into the. Yes. Uh, this book I'm holding in my hands, this Church History and the Fullness of Times, three different semesters of college education on the Restoration. Do you think the 1832 account and some of the stuff that happened in that account should have been in this? What is the publication year for that? And the answer is yes. So yeah, the publication, publication year is 1989 and then republished in 1993. So I haven't, I don't have that book. I haven't read it. Yeah. But, do you think the um, books that Joseph Fielding – hold on a minute, hold on. Do, do you think the book that Joseph Fielding Smith wrote on essentials in church history, knowing that he had the first uh, 1832 account in his vault, do you think that book should have included something about the 1832 account? Yes, it should have. Yeah. Do you think the church does a fair job of conveying its history's complexity to its members? And I don't mean the last 10 years. I mean – 20 years ago, 30 years ago, do you think the church did a fair job of conveying to its members the messiness of all these issues? Yes, today, no, 30 years ago. And, and one of the reasons for that is that B.H. Roberts took a particularly aggressive approach to portraying church history. He didn't include any of the warts in church history in his books as to multi-volume works on church history. Yeah. He would edit out. He would edit out phrases. Yeah. How about Bruce he R. McConkie? Uh, How about Joseph know? Fielding Smith? Bruce R. McConkie was not a historian, and Joseph Fielding Smith was not a historian either. He was the church historian, though, right? That doesn't matter. The church historian, according to the Doctrine and Covenant, the church historian's duty is to assemble for research, uh, later research, Do you church think it, historical uh, matters. It's the church historian's job in the in the church in Doctrine and Covenants is not to explicate church history, but to retain and uh, create a library and excise. And so many of our church historians are not even remotely uh, church historians. Uh, Amen, uh, brother. Are, 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 professional historians or not. No, no, I get They're it. But no, I get it. But at the end of the day, we knew in the 1960s that the Egyptian papyri wasn't what it claimed to be. We knew in the 1960s that there oh. were other accounts of the first oh, I vision. Called, I called, I called on the, the Milton Babylon's book. I'm not calling about. Uh, no, no, no. I know. But uh, what, but my, I know, no, he, but he, I know Bob, but here's my trouble is that when we pose it as, Hey, it really is the member's fault. Cause they didn't read enough. And you want to give the church on some level of a little bit of a pass. I simply want to hold your feet to the fire and say, like, there's no 99% of church membership could not reasonably have been expected to understand the sticky issues because the church never gave it to them in its context. And that includes the first vision. So, by I'm, the way. so I'm not, I'm not blaming the church members for not reading anything. Whose fault is it church for not knowing? Evolving, the church is an evolving uh, institution composed 99.99% of non-historians. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Snow may have the uh, the uh, title of church history, but he doesn't know a dang thing about church history. Okay, I got I to move on. What a typical... Yeah, I got to move on from the phone call, but I want to say, typical... say one last thing, which is, you're right, they're not trained historians, but there are so many instances where these men intentionally left out parts of the story. In other words, the moment Leonard Arrington wants to start telling the history, these guys are not okay with it. And so there are so many places where it is demonstrable in church history that LDS leaders put the, the squash on being honest and transparent, and they did it in such a way that they silenced the voices, Leonard Arrington included, uh, who were trying to tell a more full story. And so I don't think they get a well, free I pass either. I was one of the Leonard Arrington's uh, students at yeah. BYU. He was criticized 
for going beyond the mandate in the Doctrine and Covenants for a church historian. The church historian is not to explicate church history. I know, but we, we, general we, we, authorities but are supposed to do that. We're responsible to be not honest. The, not and, the church historian. Yeah, but we're responsible to be honest and transparent, not just as transparent as we know how to be. I thank you. Thank you, the Bob. The church historian's job is the church historian's job is not to explicate history, but just to assemble it. I, I hear you. Christ, ex- sure, but church history or general authority. Sure, but Christ, Christ they Church are. should be honest and tell a, a full story so that people can make informed decisions. Otherwise, it's not real consent, my friend. People have you know, a right. You should examine the New Testament. It, yeah, New Testament. you. It you we should examine Lord of the Rings. I, the, yeah, the New, the New Testament doesn't convince me, though, Bob. I don't. I don't hold it. I don't know a dang thing about yeah. the Lord of the Rings. So the New yeah. Testament. It's, it's a conflict in history. It's, it's and, a myth uh, as well. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bob, can I, can I throw a towel point? here? Bob? We're going to wave. Yeah. Bob, hey, this is me. So I just want to ask you, first off, um, I hear what you're saying about the church historians not supposed to explicate, I think was your word, history. That's supposed to be for the general authorities. Right. Okay. Um, that's correct. I don't see the general authorities doing a lot of explication of church history. Well, they don't know. They don't know. It's not their fault either. They okay. just don't know. And now, Bob, there is a lot of explanation, but general authorities just don't know. They don't know. Okay, so I mean, Bob, I've talked to many of them. They don't know. Bob, I love you dearly. They don't know but... any better. They don't know any better than your own bishop would or your state president would. They don't know. Then don't act like you. They shouldn't act like they know. Then. Hey, hey, Bob. Bob. I just want to uh, question yes. you a little yes. bit on the assertion that you started out with, and uh, I'd never heard of it before. I know about Milton Backman's book, B-A-C-K-M-A-N is how he spells it, Milton Backman. And you're you're talking about it being cited in general conference. Um, I just want to let you know, I have not done an exhaustive search, though I ha- pretty much have while you've been talking to Bill. And I see that there are, first off, there's a, a general authority named Robert L., Backman spelled the same way who gets the lion's share of quotes. By the way, I went to the the website, the search engine, LDS General Conference Corpus, which you've probably heard of, right, Bob? Yes. It has all the general conference talks and you can look up a, a word or a phrase, et cetera, find out when it's been used in what context. Here's what I'm able to find, okay? Uh, what I'm able to find is that there were two instances of a citation maybe in footnotes, it's hard to tell because I only get one line, but um, to Milton V. Backman, Jr., right? Uh, the author that you're talking about. Yeah, I true. see I see that's one true. reference to him in 1999, and that was to his book, The Heavens Resound, A History of the Latter-day Saints in Ohio. You mentioned that was his area of expertise in Kirtland. And the second one was the following yeah. year in 2000, And that was to a book called The Christian Churches of America. I am unable to find any place in the LDS General Conference corpus that references any citation to Milton V. Backman for his book on the first vision. Well, I'll have to I'll have to concede the point and I'll feed you that information when I locate it. And yeah, if you if we find it, I'm happy to be corrected. I remember in particular, I I I remember in particular a, a talk on the first vision where they go into the various accounts and that they came out in it. And I mean, I don't have it before me. I can find it. Right. But, and uh, I'm not saying that but, I'm not saying you're uh, absolutely wrong. I'm just saying I tried to research it and I couldn't find yeah. it. I w- and if you do find those, Bob, I'll be well, happy I to talk about them next week on the show. I so stand send them to until Please. I can correct myself. Please do. I'm going <laughs> to let you go. We're going to move on to the next call, my friend. Thank Thanks for, for calling, call. Bob. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Did he just say that God told us that the church leaders are the ones who have to expound on church history, but Bob also admitted they're not very good at it. Yeah, you know, Bob is not, um, let's just say he's a nuanced uh, believer. He's certainly faithful. My understanding is he holds a a temple recommend, but I don't know that he would be a a, a Brad Wilcox. No, 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 and I get that. He wouldn't defend it to that degree but it just felt on some level we're making we're still making excuses for these guys when they are deceptive deceptive at every turn. I know what I what I heard and what I understood was 
that the church historian's job is not history or explicating history. It's the assembling of the history. Hmm. It's the general authority's job to explicate the history, but they're not doing that either because they don't know. And or or at least in some occasions, they seem it seems demonstrable that they don't want to. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, uh, I can't remember when it was. I'm sorry. I talk so much. I can't remember when I say things. The ability for the leaders of the church to assert plausible deniability on messy aspects of church history is gone forever with the publication of the church essays beginning in 2013. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. All right, let's move on. David McKay, I think this is, I think I know who this is. David, are you on the line? I am. I am. Can you hear me? I, yeah, we can hear you. I'm glad you're on, my friend. What can we do for you? Thank you. I've been, maybe it's long overdue, but I've been wanting to reach out to you and say hi in, in person or at least over the phone. Yeah. I've been leaving a comment on almost every episode you put out. And now I have a conflict of interest between YouTube and your, your website, uh, Mormon Discussion podcast so i haven't been doing that lately gotcha and but anyways i wanted to share maybe an experience that i had back in 2006 and I, this would have cracked my testimony a bit more if a member hadn't uh, given me a, a maybe a, a sound reasoning or an apologist uh, argument for the multiple visions that we have and he likened it to well you know it's actually more credible the fact that there are multiple versions of the of the first vision, and he he, he say, well, look, think of it as a news article that's being reported. You know, you got different reporters, that, and they get different versions or accounts of it. And also, just look at the gospels themselves. You got uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all say kind of different things too. And so, I think that. Uh, help me just kind of glance over the, the the first versions for for years because I mean that was one of my foundations. Uh, I mean the prophet Joseph Smith was huge in my testimony as as well as the the feelings of the spirit that I I pretty much attributed to God uh, giving me as witness that the Book of Mormon was true. Yeah. And so that for me really uh, held me into the church and 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 in many ways I still love the church very very much. I'm still active in the church. Um, I'm not presently worthy of holding a, a temple recommend because I have a, have a hard time accepting Jesus Christ as my, my Savior, and I have a hard time being able to answer who I believe that the church has been restored. Uh, the prop, I know I, 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 yeah. authority and, and such. I appreciate anyway, that. That's the experience I wanted to share. Yeah, yeah. We're going to hang up, but I, we're going to address that question because this was something RFM and I talked about uh, prepping for the show. So I'm going to let you go, but thank By you. By the way, David, next time you go in for your Temple Recommend interview, consider lying. Yeah, it's what a lot of people are doing today. <laughs> you are under no yeah, obligation to be more... Yeah, my mind. David, you well, are under no obligation idea, to my, be my, more... My idea. <laughs> yeah. Do it your way, my friend. My, okay. My, yeah. Have a great right. day. I'm sorry, I was talking over him. Uh, but David, you are under no obligation to be more honest with the church than the church. It is, is with you. you. We were talking about this off off the air prepping RFM. There is this apologetic argument where you go, look, if if it was a rote account said the exact same way every time, you would know that Joseph Smith was lying. Hence, because there are differences, it means he probably was telling the truth. And the point here is because we talked about Satan is in some and not in others. Angels are in some and not in others. Heavenly Father is in some and not in others. If I went to a meeting and Joe Biden was there, vice president's there, Donald Trump is there, and a bunch of the members of the Senate, and the next day somebody says like, hey, what happened yesterday? I go, oh, I got to talk to the vice president. It was amazing. And I leave out the fact that I talked to the president of the United States or that I saw him. If I leave out the fact that the Senate was there, if I leave out the fact that... Uh, uh, Donald Trump was off on the other side, you know, whatever, it becomes ridiculous at some point to justify the anomalies and contradictions, the additions and subtractions as adding to the truthfulness of the first vision. At some point, you're a lawyer, at some point, if people tell stories over and over and multiple important components are missing or added, and they're not in all of the accounts, it really doesn't point to this being more true. It points to it being almost certainly some level of embellishment and deceptiveness. Dumbest argument ever. Ever. 
that discrepancies yeah. and multiple retellings show credibility and honesty instead of incredibility and dishonesty, yeah. which is what it's used for every day to impeach witnesses in courtrooms across this country. Yeah. I've had that experience both doing it to others and having it done unto me. And between the two, I'd much rather be doing it unto others. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> All right. Last call of the night, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you are on Mormonism Live. Take us home, my friend. All right. This will just be quick. Please. Um, I've been listening to you guys forever. Um, actually, I, RFM, my son was so happy to hear that you thanked him for the keychain, the green uh, lazy learner keychain that he sent you. He listens to your podcast every night and came up and yelled, I'm famous. <laughs> he is famous. You continue. I'll be right back. All right. I'm going to let you. <laughs> um, yeah. but also, Please go ahead. You're finished your thought. Also, I, I, did want, I did want to point out that I don't, I don't know why you guys have never mentioned it, but you guys are actually one of the uh, charitable donation options on Amazon. So you can select that and, and all your uh, donations will go if you can part. Anyway, yeah, it's a good please. Way to do, I Jeremiah, are you way looking to at the screen? Here. Look at the screen. Jeremiah. I am. That's Look the one. There it yeah. is, baby. Thanks again. Your Great son is super talented. Hashtag lazy learner. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. I'm going to hang up, That's but right. yeah, thank you. I'll remind people here. Uh, go on to Amazon. Set us up as your, the, I think it's called Amazon Smile. But if you go on Amazon, you can set up set it up so that the screen donates a portion of your purchases to us every time you make a purchase from amazon.com and uh, we certainly won't turn that money down. So we appreciate it. I know that will make me smile. Look at that. And then uh, folks, uh, donations have been a little slow since the beginning of the year. Um, we we get it, like everybody has what they have, but if you don't mind, if you get value from this show, if you'll just go into mormonismlive.org, click the donate button, uh, go onto any of the podcasts you enjoy, Marriage on a Tightrope, Radio Free Mormon, uh, Almost Awakened, uh, Rami Umpton, Ruminations, Backyard Professor, all of them. Just pick one that you like. It doesn't have to be us, but pick one you like, click donate, send them a few bucks each month. Uh, it, it goes to help these folks get some worth out of all the time and energy and resources they spend. RFM, we went way too long tonight. And I'm honestly, I've got a lot of, lot of stuff going on in here. So I'm going to just go do some self-care. You know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. Well, but... you know, Stephen Harper getting us all <laughs> agitated. <laughs> you know, a phone call or two. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah Stephen Harper is going to be blowing up your phone after tonight's show. I doubt it. We're not on speaking terms anymore. So uh -oh. Uh -oh. him, Brad Wilcox, Jeffrey R. Holland. Maybe no contact orders in your future. Maybe. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to keep talking about them. <laughs> They're going to keep moving their lips. Anything else from you, my friend? No, that's it. Remember, ask me anything on Friday morning, eight o'clock mountain time. Ooh, I can't you can wait ask to me ask anything. The second anointing. You know what my answer will be? Yeah, you've you've been taught that some things are sacred and da da da. da. I don't know how the exact verbiage. Hopefully, is, a little but... more articulate than that. All right, really, seriously, <laughs> no, 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 seriously, what? seriously. Did what? you have the second anointing?